Well, happy Mother's Day. And I wanted to uh, take just a kind of a brief survey of what the Bible says about mothers. And uh, looking at this, we want to see, first of all, we, uh, we begin in the beginning. I, you know, mothers are a gift from God. Uh, you, you stop to think about this. God is, is this wonderful creative being who has come up with all these things. I love to think about this, and I've mentioned it before, but um, I mean, think about if, if the whole goal was just propagation of the species. Think of all the ways God has done that, you know. The uh, plants that stay fixed in a place and wind and things uh, cross-pollinate and so on. Uh, don't need mothers and that type of thing. You have, um, we, have a, we have a bird, that uh, a robin, that has made a nest in my wife's wreath on our, in our front. And uh, kind of interesting how, how a mother responds to this thing. My wife, it just seems funny to me, my wife saying, now I hope she doesn't make a, we, we had it where we used to live. They did that, made a nest in our wreath. And uh, so the mother bird was up there surveying it and pulling out some of the, uh, the artificial flowers that we had there. So my wife would pick it back up and put it back in there and then she'd kind of wire it in there and stay away from my wreath, you know. But she stuck with it, made the nest and laid the eggs. My wife says, now don't go out the front door because it scares her. <laughs> what, I thought we didn't like this thing, you know. No, no, this is a mother now, so we got, got a picture of the four blue eggs, and now I'm, I'm guessing four. We didn't get to count, but the little, little birds uh, being fed with uh, really luscious worms. <laughs> so uh, I think it was spaghetti, I guess, but uh, you know, you, you see how, how uh, different things happen. I guess there's worms that can come up and fertilize themselves and and then there's, a, what is it, the seahorse where the, uh, the male carries the babies and just some different things. I'm so glad he did it this way, you know? And uh, now our little babies, they can't go out and forage for themselves. They're just little helpless things. And, and it takes a mother's care and a, a daddy's care. And uh, God intended that to be the way things are because he was going to teach us about his love, as he mentions fathers and mothers. So in the beginning, Genesis 3.20, Adam called his wife's name Eve. The Hebrew is Chava, and that is living, because she was the mother of all living. This was after they had sinned, but um, God had supplied the clothing for them, the, the not the uh, perishing uh, leaves that they were wearing, but uh, rather the, the skin of animals, so a shedding of blood. And uh, so realizing that this was a forgiveness of God, um, he now names her uh, Eve living because she would be the mother of all living. So God created the family for many reasons, surely, but one is that it gives man a glimpse into the love of God. We, by this close relationship, this dependent relationship, begin to see something of God's love. God uses the fond affection of a mother to illustrate his tender love for his people. Now he uses this kind of in a, in a limited way here in Isaiah 49:15. He says, can a woman forget her ch suckling child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? And then kind of sadly says, yea, they may forget, yet will not I forget thee. So we see from time to time a mother that tries to destroy one of her children or leaves them and, and that type of thing. And we're sorry to hear that because we are so thrilled with the loving mothers have been of our experience. John Gill, the great old um, Baptist uh, commentator, said there's a natural instinct in all creatures, even in the brutal creation, meaning the brute, brute animals, and in the more brutish part of that to love their young, 
and take care of them, provide for them, supply them, and protect and defend them. <laughs> Our little robin mother, uh, we <laughs> it got kind of funny. She, we go out there, and with all the business back and forth, there was this big streak of defilement on our glass uh, door. So my wife finally got out there to clean it down and wash it off. So she says, I'm hurrying, I'm hurrying, and I'm listening. She's talking to the bird. The bird flies off the nest as soon as we come out that door. And so the bird's over there yelling at her, leave my babies alone, go away, you're bothering us. And she says, I'm, I'm just hurrying, hurry, you know, listens to this mother. So there's this baby, uh, uh, care for the babies that, uh, and, and the father uh, came back. We saw that one was up in the tree guarding while the mother went to forage for food. And we're, we're guessing that that's the duties. But anyway, that's, uh, it's, it's built within us. Lamentations 4.3, even the sea monsters draw out the breast and they give suck to their young ones. The daughter of my people has become cruel like the ostriches in the wilderness. I, I'm not familiar with what the ostriches in the wilderness do. Bury their head in the sand. I don't know what bury their eggs in the sand. John Gill says that they are among the most wicked and abandoned of mankind who are disobedient to parents and are of the same description of them represented as without natural affection. He's referring to Romans 1, 30 and 31. He lists uh, sinners, backbiters, haters of God, dis despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. In 2 Timothy 3, 2 and 3, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. It almost sounds uh, a little funny to me that, that this is listed among, you know, between blasphemers and and the other, without understanding, covenant breakers, and people that break their, their contracts, uh, right there, disobedient parents. You see how, how lofty a goal that is with God. So he says, um, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. So he lists that as uh, one of the worst things. And again, John Gill says, they are guilty of gross ingratitude who requite not their parents with filial love, family love, and duty for all the care and trouble and pains and, express, and expenses that they have been at bringing them forth and bringing them up in the world. Their performance of these duties is one part of natural religion, meaning a, a natural understanding of care. The apostle shows it, uh, calls it showing piety or godliness. He's referring to 1 Timothy 5.4. But if any widow, this is talking about uh, hiring widows to, uh, to serve in the church when they didn't have any other income. But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety or kindness at home and to requite their parent, for that is good and acceptable before God. So the way God created things is uh, to do it this way. I think an important concept for us to, uh, to understand the second thing that I wanted to emphasize in the Bible is that the mother must be honored. We are in a day when we hear so often of horrible things being done and um, mothers not being good mothers and so on. We, we kind of forget that God says he puts on the child the responsibility to honor the woman who is the mother. This showed the superiority of Judaism over other contemporary systems for those in the East generally did not honor women at all. They were to serve by giving children to the husband, but that was about it. In Leviticus 19.3, ye shall fear every man his mother, fear by respect and his father, and keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. I'm the boss, he says. King Solomon rose up to meet and bowed himself to meet his mother, who was Bathsheba, and set her at his right hand. The story is told in 1 Kings 2.19. Bathsheba therefore went unto King Solomon to speak unto him for Adonijah, one of his uh, 
brothers. And the king rose up to meet her. He's a king. And bowed himself unto her and sat down on his throne and caused a seat to be set for the king's mother. And she sat on his right hand. This is honoring as only a king could do. When Elijah called on Elisha, Elisha said, I know what you're calling me to do and it's going to be very important, but I'd like to go kiss my mother goodbye. 1 Kings 19.20. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? He says, I, I, I have no, no contract signed here, young Elisha. I wanted to take you through the wisdom literature, books, uh, the wisdom books. They emphasize the love and obedience of sons to their mothers. Uh, this is how God views us being wise. Proverbs 1.8, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Pay attention. Proverbs 6.20, My son, keep thy father's commandment, and forsake not the law of thy mother. Proverbs 10.1, The Proverbs of Solomon, A wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish son is the heaviness of his mother. Proverbs 15.20, a wise son maketh a glad father, but a foolish man despiseth his mother. It's foolishness. Proverbs 19.26, he that wasteth his father and chaseth away his mother is a son that causeth shame and bringeth reproach. Proverbs 20.20, 20, whoso curseth his father or mother, his lamp shall be put out in obscure darkness. Proverbs 23, 22 to 25. Hearken unto thy father that begat thee, and despise not thy mother when she is old. Buy the truth, purchase it, and sell it not. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice. If you end up being a good child, you see, he will rejoice. And he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him, the mother. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice when you learn to live properly. Proverbs 28, 24. Whoso robbeth his father or his mother, and saith it is no transgression, the same is the companion of a destroyer. Proverbs 29, 15. The rod and reproof, getting spanked by the parents, give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Children don't need to be taught to do bad things, actually. They need to be taught to do right things. Proverbs 30, 11. There is a generation that curseth their father and doth not bless their mother. Woe to that generation. Proverbs 30, verse 17. The eye that mocketh at his father and despiseth to obey his mother, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out. Pick out that eye and the young eagles shall eat it. What is he talking about? Why is he talking about the eye here? One of the things that you'll find these birds of prey do is when they, they come down to an animal that's laying on the ground is that they'll go over to the head and peck at the eye because if there's any life left in the animal, they will move to defend their eye. And um, what this is saying is that the person who's mocking at the father and despising to obey the mother is dead within themselves. And what happens is that those around him will come and eat him, will take of his own. Perhaps the greatest example we have is Jesus and he took the time to honor his mother while he was dying on the cross. He put her in his disciple John's care. You remember that at, that, at this particular time, his oldest brother, James, was not yet a believer. And his brethren didn't believe on him yet. So here she came to the cross to see her child dying on the cross. And he speaks. John 19, 26 to 27. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, this is John speaking of himself, he saith unto his mother, Woman, 
behold thy son. He's not talking about seeing me up here on the cross. He's saying there with you is John. Behold thy son. Then he said to the disciple, behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. And so he was caring for her at a, at, you know, in a way that allowed her as a believer uh, to be put into the hands of another believer rather than the unbelieving family. And then let me close with this, that the Bible gives mothers special mention. And you, uh, you'll just see this from place to place, and I have three passages to share with you. Timothy had a faithful mother and grandmother. Now, uh, especially those writing from the East, you can hardly find them mentioning women. Women were not to be trusted. They could hardly tell the truth, all, these, all this concept of women. And yet here, uh, the scripture says in 2 Timothy 1.5, Paul says, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned, the unpretended faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, I am persuaded that in thee also. And so he recalls very fondly these uh, two women that uh, her, uh, his father had died some time before and uh, they were raising him best they could. And when they had the opportunity to send him out with uh, uh, a missionary Paul, they said this would be a good thing for him to, to learn from a, a man who knows what he believes and is active in the work of God. Uh, but uh, these, were, these were Christians that led their son to the Lord. Another situation here that's not quite clear to us, but uh, Paul seems to have adopted a mother. Now, we do that from time to time. We have uh, kind of adopted grandchildren and so on, and uh, we, we love them dearly. But the point that I'm making here is that... Um, there came a time, Paul refers to the time when he had to forsake all that he had. And the verb there is in the aorist tense, which pictures that it happened at one point in time. There was a time after he got saved and he kept getting into trouble because he was, he was the head church persecutor who turned main discipler of the church, you know. And so the Jews hated him, and they were after him, and they wanted him dead. And so he went back clear across the, the, the map to Tarsus, where he, where he was born, where his family would have stayed. And he was there until uh, Peter found him there and brought him back to ser start serving at the church at Antioch. Um, it seems to me that he went there certainly to speak to his family. But that doesn't seem to have gone well. Um, so that there was something said about f from father or mother or both that uh, you are no longer a son of ours. Uh, you, you inherit nothing from us. And so his loss of all things at one particular time probably was that time. But uh, along the way, he found someone who treated him nicely, and um, notice what he says, Romans 16, 13. Salute, he's writing to somebody who is in the area with Rufus, and he says, salute Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. <laughs> so Rufus' mother was a person who counted him as one of her sons. And uh, just the fact that this is mentioned, I think, is a lovely concept. And then let me close with this and um, see that I'm closing much early, but that's all right. This is Mother's Day. Go pick a flower and uh, go, go out to eat or something. God counsels the church. I was mentioning earlier that um, widows in ancient times uh, didn't have insurance um, unless their husband was very wealthy and they just got everything. Uh, they you know, and and were too, if they were too old to, to work and labor, then it, they were dependent on children and family members. 
So some of them didn't have those children, or those children were gone, or those children didn't care for them. And um, so he said the church should uh, step up and hire these women to do certain jobs. One of them was to teach younger women godly things. And he gives the examples for this in Titus 2, 3 to 5. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, or being feminine here, or uh, holy women. They are holy women. Not false accusers. This is one who foments strife, not, a, not one who stirs up strife. Not given to much wine. Teachers of good things. And what good things should they teach? That they should teach the young women to be sober or wise. This means serious. To love their husbands. This is the only passage in the New Testament that speaks of loving the husband. All the other things talks about being submissive to the husband, being, in, being subject to the husband. But here, they were to love, and they, it was loving service that they were to give, and uh, to teach the young women how to love and give a loving service to their husbands, and then to love their children. It's one thing to put up with your children. It's one thing to, to meet their needs and just wish they would shut up. But it's another thing to love them and to love them. So they were to teach them to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. This doesn't mean they never left home. It meant that they kept the home well. They were good housekeepers. Good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. The woman who doesn't do this, then people say, yeah, and she calls herself a Christian, you see, blaspheming the word of God. So God enjoys this concept of making us to depend upon mothers and fathers. And then the mother was to be honored. And God himself uh, says that part of being a good Christian is to honor and give special mention to the mothers. So happy Mother's Day. Let's recognize God that's on our side. The uh, idea of women obeying their husband has been taken by the feminists to say that the Bible uh, demeans women. It's the Bible that has given women meaning from the very beginning. Uh, as I mentioned, it was the pagan way to treat the, the woman as barely a slave and often a body slave at that. Let's pray. Father, we ask thy blessing as we turn to thee that we might understand what it means from your standpoint to honor the mother. For Father, all of these things are in your hand. It is in your, uh, in your will, in your plan for us as individuals to give us the mother and father that we have. This may not be who we thought we might choose, but you knew that you wanted to build a certain character within us, to have a certain background. You knew what we needed and you gave us that. <clears throat> we know that the sins of the father, sins of the mother, are not passed on as sins to the, to the uh, children. Those sins are our own. But we can overcome them. We can um, build a character that is greater than what our parents had. But for those of us who had parents that were worthy of imitation and could see the good character in them, we ask that you might help us to solemnly build that within our own lives. We thank you for a time that we can look to your word and understand your truth and see that you gloried in creating mothers. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.